Oh, hey, good evening and welcome to another First Friday event. Sorry, I was distracted enjoying the woodpeckers out working on my um, bird feeders. Um, this is another First Friday event sponsored by the Woodside Arts and Culture Committee. Uh, volunteers who are here to support our community by providing interesting events every First Friday of the month. So this evening, we're going to explore the subtle aspects of many kinds of nature, some of which you might not particularly think about. And our leader on our interesting safari this evening is Charles Hood. Charles has studied birds and natural history from the Amazon to Tibet. He has seen more than 5,000 species of birds. He's widely published um, both natural history and poetry, many of which have won awards. He has spent time in Antarctica, and now he teaches writing and photography at Antelope Valley College in the Mojave Desert. So before I ask Charles to step into the limelight, I would like to remind us that, that nature is so powerful, so strong. Capturing its essence is not easy. And as we will see through Charles's presentation this evening, sometimes when we are looking for nature, it can be found in more subtle and not so obvious ways. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce um, Charles and welcome to the first Friday event. Thank you, everybody. It's a great honor to be with you tonight. I'm going to share screen. I have a PowerPoint. There's a fair bit of content to get through, so we'll get going. This is a topic that I've come to more recently. I've had a conventional nature upbringing, I think, <laughs> in the high church of nature. But the more I talk about nature with non-converted people, shall we say, with the, with the regular folks out there in, the, in regular public land, uh, the more I realized I've got a, a, perhaps a too, too narrow definition of nature. And that's come about in part because I've been involved in a number of recent publications, a bird book, an animal book, Wild Los Angeles, uh, which was the National History Museum of Los Angeles County. And so I've gotten to be behind the scenes deciding what pictures to go in, and these are philosophical problems that don't have one simple, easy answer. But in the case of Wild LA, should we allow there to be along the Los Angeles River, let's say 55 miles long, lots of habitat there still, should we include tagging? If there's graffiti in the background of the shot, should we allow that to stay in? Uh, what about the tents of the unhoused people? How do we handle that visually or even in the narrative? Because that's a situation that changes month by month or year by year. So these are things that we put some things into a book and we leave some out. And it's been some very interesting conversations, or we might say even heated conversations. And that's continued on. I have two books coming out this fall. Uh, one's a reptile and amphibian book uh, uh, written with uh, two, two colleagues, one at Berkeley and, and uh, one at Northern Arizona University. And again, what are we going to include? What are we going to take out? And then I have a book of essays, a salad only the devil would eat, the joys of ugly nature, in which uh, in that book, I'm particularly uh, happy to celebrate the ugly parts of nature. But having these conversations with editors, what does the audience want? What do bookstore managers want to put on their shelves? It really made me realize we have a relatively simplistic view of nature that we've inherited. So will the real nature please stand up if we remember that old you know, TV show? So this is a, a juvenile red-shouldered hawk. I took this picture a week ago. It's down in the West Adams of Los Angeles near USC. And there are lots of editors who probably wouldn't want me to have that picture in the book. I'm like, don't you have one with a tree behind it? And in fact, if I move to you know, stage left a little bit, I could get a tree behind it. But why not? These birds are in the cities. And so how about acknowledging that aspect of nature? We'll start with this picture. We're gonna come back to it later. I put this in just today because you know it's Lake Tahoe. So I took this picture in June, uh, Taylor Marsh on the south end of Lake Tahoe. Obviously it would be a very different view if we were doing a live stream camera from there now. But I think most of us would say on a scale of sort of one to 10, one being ugly or, 
our cities are urban or paved and 10 being, you know, great, pure, you know, nature with a capital N, this is pretty much on that nine, 10 side of the scale. We're going to want to see a calendar of these kind of images or go there on our, on our vacation. And in comparison, if I just take a shot of the Los Angeles River, this is uh, what's called Frogtown locally, Alicia Park at water near Dodger Stadium. That's Interstate 5 uh, on the on the right hand side of the image or the top of the image and the and the mostly cemented in uh, bed of the river on in the bottom. So if we have our uh, mythical one to 10 scale, so this is probably not going to be a nine or a 10. And then if we come to where I live, which is in the Antelope Valley of the high desert on the other side of the mountains from east of Los Angeles. Uh, this is not my house, but uh, I'll say I can get there from my house. And I think most people are like, no, this is this. How could there be any nature there? Look, that's terrible. It's ugly. It's tagged. It's ruined. Uh, but the reality is, if we have this sort of, you know, bad nature to good nature or impure to pure scale, and I think mentally many of us do, but if we have that scale, I think we're ignoring some of the metrics or, or sort of the data. If I just go, if I'm going to be a data driven scientist and just say, based on, sheer numeric value, then the Lake Tahoe nature is actually not as close to nine or 10 as we might think. So if I go back to that middle scene of that Los Angeles River with the interstate freeway right there, there's 183 species of birds that have been seen just where I took that picture, that, that actual little section of the river uh, on the, on the eBird checklist. And that's actually with not that many observers. 320 checklists is actually not that many. So there is a tremendous avian diversity there. There are actually more birds seen over the course of a year in that little urban river by Frogtown in Los Angeles than there are at Taylor Marsh in Lake Tahoe. And on a numeric scale, there are there is more nature there, depending how we want to define nature. Or if I go back to that little tumbled down cement uh, tagged up wreck in the Antelope Valley, that if you want to see a western fence lizard, that's the ideal place to go. Uh, and in fact, we like western fence lizards, uh, also called blue bellies. I think many of us know, but if you don't, uh, of course, Lyme's disease is spread by ticks. Uh, when the ticks bite that lizard, the same ticks that bite us also bite that lizard. It has an uh, a mechanism in its bloodstream that neutralizes the Lyme disease in the gut of the tick. And so in areas with lots of Western fence lizards, it actually seriously diminishes the amount of Lyme disease in the general tick population. So we want to be around those Western fence lizards. One of the aspects of talking about nature is the way in which we have a relatively vertical binocular primate diurnal way of seeing the world, since we're tall, vertical, binocular sighted primates, and that includes also a sense of scale or size. This is almost off scale the wrong way. I'm going to talk about going small in scale. It's almost too big. That is all that tumbleweed stuff. I'll do the little mouse thing here. All that stuff, oh, my little cursor here, that is all one nest or successive you know, years of nests by a desert wood rat. That's a very tall gentleman. He's about 6'3", six, 6'4", six, uh, there on the, on the left-hand side of the image. And boy, that's almost like too big to be nature. Like that almost seems like it's someone took a dump truck at the top of the cliff and you know, it dumped all those sticks off or something. One little tiny, one little tiny uh, rat did that. I think for most of us, and this includes all of you know me growing up and me working on books. You know what's nature? Oh, it's a scrub jay, or, you know, or it's a deer. It's about this big and it's nice and bright and it comes out in the daytime and we can you know see it and enjoy it and take a little picture and, and we're happy to see one. We write it in our in our nature log. Maybe our sense of nature will diminish down, and we'll include a wood rat. They're pretty small. They're nocturnal. They're in kind of hard to get places. Uh, they're not typically easy to see. That's kind of, I think, on the bottom threshold. We all know that they're out there. We know there are wood rats, you know, dusky footed wood, wood rats in, you know, in the hills near you guys. Um, but really, we don't think about them like the way we think, oh, I want to see a deer. Or, you know, look, I saw some nature. But if we go even smaller still in our scale, now we get down to uh, the, the field guides will call it Jerusalem cricket. You may know it as potato bug. You know, they're about that big and they're in your garden soil. And they're in the, well, they were in the chaparral originally. Now they're in your garden soil. Now you have a garden there. Or, you know, slugs. They're sort of, small and icky and not very photogenic. And if we lead a nature hike, you know, with, with let's go with, meet at 9 a.m. for the nature hike. And all we see is, you know, two Jerusalem crickets and a slug. People, I think, are going to be, where are the deer? Where are the blue jays? They're going to feel disappointed. And that, to my mind, is unfair because, of course, slugs are doing their thing. Crickets are doing their thing. They are natural in the sense that they are interacting with the ecology. And because we are primarily diurnal, or we've been trained to think of ourselves as diurnal, 
and to lock the door at night and, and uh, put on the headlights in the car and turn on all the lights in the house and your home, those kind of things. We have this sense that nature is more a daytime thing than a nighttime thing. And that nature also is primarily a woodland thing, grassland thing, meadowy thing, rather than downtown Los Angeles at night. Even though, again, historically, I could say, well, what about all the box of swifts that are in, going into roost and blah, blah, blah. So if we look at the Bay Area, I can give you a number. You might, maybe you know this. May, it was a, when I looked it up, I was a little bit pleased and surprised. So out of the 22 species of bats that are in California overall, which are include lots of species that are down in the, in the southern deserts and in mine shafts and caves down there, but there still are 16 species of bats that have been documented in the greater Bay Area, including big brown bat, which is this, this one on, on the right here. And uh, if, if you've never heard this fact, the, the number keeps inflating, by the way, it used to be 600 mosquitoes an hour. Now, I've heard, now I saw a documented source that said 1,000 mosquitoes an hour. We like them because they, they eat things that annoy us. And you can know what bats are around your own backyard, even right now, if you want to turn me off and you know, turn off the program and go step outside. If you buy a $300 bat detector, which plugs into your mobile phone, your cell phone, um, and you download the app, which is free, uh, you can step outside and it magnifies echolocation calls. So we know that the bats are doing that sort of sonar thing, you know, to hit the little bugs. And that's not usually audible to humans, particularly as we get older and we've been to too many rock and roll concerts. Uh, the few bats we might have heard when we were young people is much, much more reduced. But with a, uh, a handheld bat detector, you can put it on your iPad, you can put it on your cell phone, and it'll actually make like a little seismograph, you know, when there's an earthquake, it'll actually show you, you know, here's the call, and it'll offer some identification uh, tips as well. So we can interact with our bats if we want to. One of the premises I'd like to explore tonight is the idea that nature is a cultural construct. But since I don't want to stay here till about 1130 at night explaining it, I'm going to make the claim and just ask you to take it on faith for a little while. So there is no such thing as nature. There is only the nature that we decide as a culture with our own friend, our own frame, our own lens. We say, this is going to be nature, this little box right here. And so I was, this is Spring Lake uh, Regional Park up in Son uh, Sonoma County. Yeah, it looks like nature is blue. It's got some trees. The sun's shining. It's great. But if we actually look at what most people call nature most of the time, which I can do by doing you know, a Google search for nature images, and I see that, oh, they, most people want a tree, some water, uh, foreground, middle ground, background. We want that kind of horizontal spread. But that's not a very broad range of ecologies, and not a very brain, broad range even of ways that humans can interact with these ecologies. It's a very narrow, well-watered, <laughs> northern European, six-foot-tall, binocular view version. And that vision of nature comes to us secondhand. We're receiving training we didn't even know we were receiving it. People didn't even know when they made a jigsaw puzzle or a, or a birthday card, they, were, they didn't even know they were training us. But we've received this sense of nature has a certain vista, it's got a certain amount of vegetation, a certain amount of water from a variety of sources, including Hudson River School. I don't want to be too academic about this, but we could, we could spend an hour just looking at the ways in which painters in North America have portrayed the landscape and what conventions they carried with them from you know, the old world, blah, blah, blah. And that ties in as well with painters like Caspar David Friedrich, writers like Shelley and Coleridge and Wordsworth. These were these people that were the early 19th century poets, writers, thinkers, essay writers, and they were framing the world with a particular set of terms or goals or concepts that we can call the romantic sublime, capital R, capital S. And again, I'll just ask you to take it on faith. That's a, that's a, that's a thing, you know, if you Google it, you'll find it all over the place. And so someone like, like Friedrich here painting, what is the romantic sublime? A young man alone in the mount, top of the mountain, looking out over the foggy wilderness, having these awe-inspiring thoughts. It's John Muir up in the palm, pine tree, you know, during the windstorm or getting hit by the waterfall when he goes behind Yosemite Falls. A single person, usually male, out in relatively seemingly natural landscape, although that's a little bit artificial terminology. And if that is indeed where we get our sense of who we are as nature inhabitors, it only was made worse by all of the prose that came out of Henry David Thoreau. So we wrote, you know, Walden Pond, the cabinet Walden Pond, Emerson, one of the most prominent intellectuals in the mid 19th century in, in North America and also in Europe for that matter. Of course, John Muir inheriting their legacy. Emerson met Muir 
near slightly late, you know, slightly later, but the transcendentalist movement conquered Massachusetts are inheriting then these romantic tropes of man in the wilderness and subjectivity, and we're throwing away all the rules and science of the enlightenment. And that's a whole lot of intellectual right? It's just intellectual nonsense, taking on faith. When we look at a nature calendar or we give someone a birthday card, we're inheriting a whole bunch of lenses or filters that are making us say, that's nature and that ain't. But if we think about the rest of our lives, our non-nature lives, if we admit that nature is a cultural construct, we then could reset our terminology and construct a different nature if we want. And we do this all the time with other aspects of our lives. So for example, some, somebody on the Zoom tonight, I'm sure drives a Prius and good for you. It's a snappy little car, reasonably priced. Uh, it's got that tremendous you know, gas mileage. And what we think of as a car now is very different than what my grandfather thought when he bought his Plymouth. And he was going for size and the fins and the status and the white, white walls and the gas mileage was the least of his concerns. Uh, by the way, that is a picture from Hollywood, California from the 50s. And that little brick thing is the incinerator before they actually had curbside pickups or rubbish. You burned your own rubbish. It was actually outlawed even by the 50s, but it's his, my grandfather's house still had the old incinerator. But even what we consider a car what we consider desirable in a car, how we market it, what colors those cars are, that's evolved as we would expect. How we portray and think about women has evolved. Here's a woman supposedly dancing in her high heels and what was for that time a very daring skirt length. And then this ad just came out about three weeks ago from Victoria's Secret. Uh, well, actually, I, I guess it's the beginning of the summer now, but I think about a few months ago now. But the idea of Victoria's Secret just being skinny white chick in their, in, chicks in their underwear is, is evolving. So now we can have normal sized people, uh, people of color. So we're no longer going to talk about women quite as simplistically and as narrowly as we used to, or at least I hope we're not, or at least culture is starting not to talk about women that way. And then what is art? So Basquiat, you know, now that's worth $40 million there. And even how we advertise Tiffany's. So this is a Tiffany's ad here on the right, Beyonce, Jay-Z. So people of color are now going to be able to inhabit the central stage in a way that wasn't true when Audrey Hepburn was, was the face of Tiffany's. So we have, um, we have, how do we talk about cars? That's changed. How do we talk about women? That's changed. How do we talk about art? That's changed. So therefore I'm going to say, heck yeah, let's talk about nature as differently and as evolutionarily informed as we've talked about those other cultural aspects, including veganism and our and political choices. We have a number of things that our parents and grandparents and great grandparents would be surprised by if we said, oh, this is, you know, here, I've got a lovely vegan taco for you. And they're like, what, what where's the meat? Are you so poor, you don't have meat there in Woodside. And so if this is gonna be nature, we do have to have a cultural conversation that would allow it to come on in. Right now, 2021, Friday night, if I go to most editors of most of the nature books I work on, and I say, I got a great picture for the cover here, these dead palm trees in Desert Center and in San Bernardino County on the way, you know, on, on Interstate 10, they're going to, oh, no, oh, no, people don't want, the, where's your water? Hood, where are your meadows? Where's the, where's the vista? Where's the lonely guy looking out over the fog? This ain't nature. And they're saying that partly out of their own sincere convictions, but they're also going to be saying audiences aren't ready for it. But audiences can get ready for anything. You know, Victoria's Secret a year ago didn't have African American women and stout African American women. They had the naked white chicks. So we can evolve if we so choose to. And why not? And so one of the things I want to think about when I look at nature is who's controlling access. And I mean that culturally, I mean that legally, literally. Uh, this is Patagonia, Arizona, one of the famous bird watching stops in on the southeastern Arizona little loop. If you don't know, thank you to the Gadsden Purchase. We ended up with a little piece of Mexican biology that's part of the state of Arizona. So if you're a bird watcher, you can go down there and see tropical birds in Patagonia and other related towns right along the border. Uh, there's a, you know, there's jaguar, there's a jaguar down in the Patagonia mountains right now. There's an ocelot currently in Arizona. These, these tropical species reach their northern limit just over the U.S. border. So if you're in Patagonia, it's a place to go bird watching hummingbirds and all the nice little restaurant there. Uh, and you got to get some petrol while well, you're going to go to the gas station. And it says politically incorrect gas station. And this, by the way, is also where the border patrol gases up their vehicles. It's, there's some dirt roads that, that come up over the Mexican border and 
land here at town. So the so Migra is gassing up here. I don't know. I think it's funny. Like I get that they're just having fun with it, but I also don't know how I would feel if I were someone from a politically disadvantaged group. As a white guy, I don't have to worry quite as much about you know how what people think of me or what they're going to say a little bit. But uh, I wouldn't. I would not so sure. I would how I would feel if I was a person of color or if I was transgender, would I even want to get gas and go bird watching in Patagonia if this is the only gas station in town? And they're thinking it's fun to be who they are. And even something as pure and as well-intentioned and as, as uh, you know, 10 out of 10 on the one to 10 scale as the Nature Conservancy, I just went to their website because I was just sort of curious how they market their preserves because, you know, I give them money and I want to know who's, who's getting access. And of the three choices, open, limited, or closed, two thirds of the icons are actually closed. And reading this from a, from a graphic standpoint, it's actually hard to tell which ones are open. We should actually use green, amber, red or something to make at least I'd know, oh, I wanna go on vacation here because there's some of the green ones I can at least get in. But the idea that two thirds of the property isn't open to the rest of the public, I just think that's a little bit risky uh, culturally, politically. I'm not sure it's a philosophy that I necessarily want to endorse. This is something that we did talk about when I made Wild LA and that I don't think many people talk about yet in the nature book guidebook business. And I say that since I'm working on some books now, uh, no car or bus required Bay Area hikes you can get by BART, that the hiking guide requires you to drive somewhere seems to me a little bit of a contradiction or a little bit problematic and that we don't have hiking guides centered on the idea of places you can get to by bike or that are going to be have hikes that are distributed equally among all of the different socioeconomic groups. So there are, of course, great hikes in the Bay Area. I, I love coming up uh, from, from the desert. It's fabulous. But the access points, the trailheads, typically are not available to the complete population, the complete socioeconomic spectrum. That seems to me risky, that we're going to exclude people. Why would they then want to vote for the kind of legal protections that I'd like, or even the type of politicians that I'd like to see voted into office. If I do make it up to a trailhead, so this is Eaton Canyon, it's in uh, the far end of, of, of Pasadena. If you know Los Angeles, so there's a 210 freeway going you know, along the, along the north, northern edge of the city. And this is uh, Altadena, so the higher, higher of the two towns. Uh, Eaton Canyon is a lovely place. There's a little waterfall there. If it's, uh, uh, if it's a wet year, uh, lovely trails. You, you bears are seen there. There's pumas potentially. Uh, lots of you know, lots of native birds. But as soon as I finally get there, you really can't get there by train, by by public train, by our by our BART down here. You can't get there really by the Gold Line. You really do need a car, or a friend with a car, or at least a very vigorous bicycle ride. But when you get there. Here I am. I've come all the way up from my, you know, I've taken a day off from my laboring job. I'm a blue collar person. I live in a relatively impoverished area. There's no parks where I live. I, I, I really want to get into nature. I've, I've heard all the, all the people talk about this nature thing. I want to hear about it, see about it, taste it, smell it. And I get up here and there are 8,000 signs telling me, buzz off dude, whoever you are, you're going to have a dog, you might have a skateboard, you're, you know, blah, blah. It's the most unfriendly, ugly, unwelcoming thing. It's a good thing I feel confident in nature. It's a good thing I know just to blow off the signs and keep on walking. Because otherwise, if I arrived any place I was unfamiliar, and I saw this much hostility, and furthermore, this much <laughs> badly designed hostility. They're so ugly. And, 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 does anybody have a, a T-square in the LA County Park system? Like, can I show you what a vertical line should be like? All your things are falling over. We, we make fun of other countries. Like, oh, that's a third world country. Like, well, if I'm a third world country, I'll go to Altadena. So gender and culture, who has permission to be out in the woods and what are we gonna do to control access, allow access? And one of my little social agenda things I get to do as a nature book writer is I get to actually suggest to the editors, how about this picture? How about that picture? And if I wanna do a great blue heron on a shopping cart in the LA River with some graffiti in the background, probably it's not gonna get published. I can ask and I can try to make my pitch for it, sure. But if I kind of am a, a little bit more clever about it, not quite so aggressively in your face, I've got a social agenda, watch me push it. But I'm a little nicer about it, a little more gentle, I can at least do this. And so this is for a book that I'm working on right now called Wild Sonoma. It is gonna feature the Napa Sonoma wine country area, uh, which is really diverse and interesting as I'm sure many of you know, but I'm intentionally as the author and photographer going out of my way to say, guess what? It doesn't always have to be the old white guy wandered around, so how about, Jeannie Worka here, who has great stance, great binoculars, and feels confident being in the, in the, in the woods alone. So I want to show 
different perspectives, different racial groups, different socioeconomic groups in my nature books intentionally. Uh, I had to do a, a fly fishing thing. And so luckily uh, I found a, a woman who's a fabulous caster, man, she had a great aim and, and great presence. Uh, so I was able to show someone who wasn't on the LL Bean you know, catalog uh, of, the, of the old old guy doing it. I could show uh, a woman doing my fly fishing for the river scene. But even expanding out past that, past the LL Bean catalogs, uh, I re I'm really having to kind of pivot myself from what I expect about nature and what I kind of want to tolerate or even encourage. So there's a group called Latino Outdoors, and I was on their website just seeing, okay, what kind of things do they do? And I'll be I'll be honest, in my narrow-mindedness and in my romantic poetness, my my Percy B. Shelley-ness and my Casper David Friedrichness, I hadn't really thought about community versus solitude because i came from a family of relative you know we I had a brother you know so a little family of four and you know i've got some kids of my own but i don't come from a large family and i don't really hang out with large families on average uh, and so the sense of like community that we want to do things outdoors that will invite 10 20 or 30 people and that we might want to do poetry in in nature not just do the bird watching walk with our great little fancy binoculars like Tom has and like like I have my Zeiss, but that we would actually be using it for a cultural activity, a community activity, and that for some communities, their immigration status is a very, very legitimate pressing concern. So migración is across borders. Presumably, this is going to be a, a community writing event, and you're allowed to talk about your anxiety about reaching uh, a certain kind of immigration status, or I'm a, I am or am not a dreamer, or or the dreaming, you know, the dreamer law got passed or not passed. That that's going to be something that takes place in nature, because why can't nature include my everyday cultural concerns? Part of my training on this has been a man named Quint McKay. Uh, he's in Sonoma. He is a Native American, and he's been very kind to take me through the landscape and try to show me the ways in which his people not past tense used the land but present tense still inhabit the land and i think for most of us if, if i told you well he's got uh, legal access to some streams because they collect food and, and material for baskets and so on in fact actually he's an expert bas basket maker himself his baskets are actually at the met in new york as we speak at the Metropolitan museum of art if i said oh this cultural group has legal access from the bureau of land management to, to collect these plants we thought oh, that's good that's lo lovely we owe these people a little bit of reparation so i'm glad but then when i was down at the salt and seabird watching and i saw that uh, a catholic organization had made a eight foot high Jesus on a boulder and they put the Virgin Mary at the top. I was like, hey, that's graffiti. What's that? What are you doing here? Churches are small brown things you go to on Sunday with nothing. You know, I'm a Puritan. I was raised by Puritans. And so I have to stop and say they had some experience that made this a shrine. There's actually candles and other decorations all over all over this particular piece of clip. Something about this feels sanctified to these people. And if I say nature is a holy space or it's a spiritual space, great, then why not let it be a holy space? And that would include allowing in religious celebrations that are really not hurting my feelings all that much. Oh, you painted on the rock. Well, yes, they did. And they actually gave Jesus blue eyes, which is maybe problematic from our from a gender perspective or from a racial perspective. But nonetheless, they're celebrating their faith community in the outdoors and i think my default is like hey you should take that to the church do that in the parking lot that's nature is really i think not fair to them it's my hang up that i'm a puritan i don't think we should have jesus on rocks jesus belongs to my little hymnal and then i think it's also short-sighted of me because who's going to vote to preserve those rocks in 10 years when the housing development wants to come in and blow them all up I need I need to have an alliance with the with the people that are actually using the landscape. And this is something that I have been slow to come to by, you know, due to my own stupidity, my own bias, my own my own narrow mindedness in my training. Uh, and we know that John Muir said some ugly things, too. So uh, it's if there's a reckoning going across the board, who gets to use the land, who gets to control access, whose land is it? Another aspect of nature that I think many of us have internalized is that there is humanity and human life and cities and civilization and culture on this side and then there's nature and humans and nature are two different things and i can tell you i have two pictures of the same bird this is lesser yellow eggs both these shots i took in alaska this summer and of the two the one on the left can get published and it's not just because it's got a better background it is a better picture because i've got a, a, a more shallow depth of field i kind of blew it on the one on the right but i don't know if you can see where my little mousy cursor is right here on the bottom right that has a green rubber band on its leg because it's part of a study there someone has trapped it in a net and marked it so that when they see it with binoculars okay green four is mating with red two you know how biology studies work right so 
nine out of 10 photo editors for a nature book would tell me, yeah, uh, you want to Photoshop that one out hood because we're not public. Look, what did it step in trash? Is that like a six pack thing? Or did it, why, why has it got a rubber band on its leg? Well, because someone's studying it, but it's still a wild bird. It migrated there. It's going to migrate away. It's not in any way in a zoo. It's not in any way tame, but we like our nature to be removed of humanity, dehumanized in, in, a, in a kind of a broad sense. Well, that seems to me not entirely a logical position, you know, a logical position to take. And this is another picture, you know, what do ravens do in the, it, even in the Bay Area and especially in some of what I call exurbia, the, the outlying areas, they, they eat trash, they eat roadkill. And so this is the raven in its natural habitat. You know, I love, you can see the beak, you can see the wedge-shaped shale, you can see the, the fingers on the prime, all the ID markers of how to tell a raven from a crow are in that picture. Good luck to me ever trying to get it published because we don't want to show the trash because we actually want to just show it on a sand dune or a, you know an oak tree or whatever. This idea that the humanness of nature can't be ever admitted to it's, we, it has to be somehow hidden. And yet, like this bird, this is a cactus wren at Anza Borrego State Park, and it loved this blue dumpster. It was it that was the center of the territory, and I'm like, shh, shh come on, come on, little wren. Go over there. There's some okatia over there. No, oh, oh, there's some choya over there. Come on. I want to get my little picture for my books, right? And like, oh, I, I'm going to sing from here. And then where when it left here, it went to the top of a Winnebago and sang from the air conditioner on the top of the window because that was the tallest thing. The shrubby ends of Brago has some shrubby brush, you know, that even the uh, the creosote's pretty low here. So like the tallest perch around is the air conditioner on top of Winnebago. And that's where this bird was going to sing its little masculine heart out and say, look at me, I'm such a buff, buff cactus friend. Don't be intruding on me. So nature is actually something uh, that co coexists with humanity in this bird's mind quite happily so. And then we know that things like Allen's hummingbirds that had a relatively small range historically on the Palos Verdes Peninsula and on the Channel Islands are spreading throughout Southern California. And now there are records all the way up to the Oregon border or in Tucson, the bats have learned how to raid the hummingbird feeders and get nectar. Instead of why waste your time going to an agave and fluttering around, there's not much nectar there, just go straight to the source. And so they've learned how to poach hummingbird feeders, which kind of, I kind of like it. I think it's, I think it's kind of fun. So if we don't have humanity intruding in nature, I then, I guess I have to airbrush out the radio collar on P22. This is that famous puma still alive that lives in Griffith Park uh, in the Hollywood Hills. So the smallest known range of any male mountain lion in the history of mountain lions, uh, single male, it crossed all the freeways to get there from its birthplace in the Santa Monica Mountains, had to cross the 405 freeway and the Hollywood freeway set up in in Griffith Park, no one ever sees it. Uh, even the, even the, when the uh, staff go to change the batteries and the radio collar, they have to use the radio detector to find where it's napping. And so this is a camera trap photograph of P22. But I think eight out of ten photo editors would say, "Can we lose the radio collar? Or do you have another angle that kind of hides it?" Or you know, it's it, that intrusion of, and it's actually coming out of a culvert, you know, in the little drainage ditch under the road. So we're not that wild about admitting that is a very handled animal, a very studied handled animal. And the idea that it's sort of pure or natural is only partially true. It's also partially true that it is a manipulated animal. As we can see in this next slide, we're not supposed to intervene with nature, let nature run its course, but uh, it got mange from eating coyotes that had been eaten, bobcats that had been eating dead rats that had been killed by rodenticide and that rodenticide had built up and it really made p22 a sick animal and when they went to change the batteries they gave it some vitamins and treated it and and made it healthy again so if we think that nature is without humanity in the case of p22 there is no p22 without humanity intervening uh, and letting go by the way i don't know if you know all the stories how much you follow the los angeles news my favorite story of p22 is uh, it, it used to jump into the Los Angeles Zoo over the fences at night. They've made the fences even taller now to keep it out. I used to go in the zoo at night, just hang out. And one morning the zookeepers came to, to work and the, all the koalas were, were completely shell-shocked. <laughs> oh my God, oh my, oh my God. And like, what's going on? Like one, two, three, wait, one of the koalas is missing. And they realized the, the P22 had gone into the zoo grounds, gone into the koala cage, <laughs> snatched a koala, jumped back over, jumped back out and eaten it out, out in nature. I, I'm, I'm on the side of P22 on that one. So here we are, nature, I'm so happy. We got back, we're done. We're done with mangy animals and Jerusalem crickets and trees with no tops on in the desert. But we finally got back to some nature and I'm so happy about that. Well, 
yes and no y'all so this is june this is a real it's not photoshopped i didn't you know steal this off a jigsaw puzzle i went down there i went there to work on a book actually that's now gonna have to change because of the fires but here's all the things that are going on that really are between real nature or pure nature or 10 out of 10 nature and the reality of how humans interact first of all of course i had to drive my car to lake tahoe i don't live there and i had to find a place to park my car legally not on the side of the roads so i don't get a ticket uh, i had to get fuel or either petrol you know either petrol or electricity those are the only two things that you know or maybe hydrogen if you're one of those people but i'm not i need fuel and then i had to take a trail and then that trail had definite markers where i could or couldn't go big off limit markers so if i back up i'm actually standing right at the fence line where they have this sort of emergency orange webbing you know that sort of security webbing like don't cross into the marsh but stay on your side so i'm actually you know leaning over the fence of my fancy camera and speaking of fancy cameras of course i do need a fancy camera i have a very expensive camera very fancy lens and i'm looking at land that is fire suppressed as we've heard about so much this past week past week it was formerly logged quite heavily it was also then grazed quite heavily so that land is not pure nature that is post logging post grazing currently fire suppressed although it's going to be post fire suppressed eventually and of course it's ex minus the original inhabitants that have been there for 10,000 years, the Native Americans and their land use practices and their settlements, their, their structures and their trails and their crops and their plants, all the things that we would have been doing, their cultural practices have been removed as well. So it is a type of nature, but, but it'd be hard to argue that it is actually uncontaminated, pure, 10 out of 10, no intervention nature. It's just merely another version. And not only do I have a fancy camera, and I do, but of course, I needed Apple products. Thank you for Apple. And I need all the software from Adobe to make it run. I need electricity to run that computer. And we all need just a boatload of electricity right this minute. So thank you for putting dams on the Columbia River, whoever had that good idea, so I can get some high currency voltage coming down those DC lines that follow I-5 down from Washington down to California. The amount of electricity we're getting from solar is rising, but it's not it's not running my computer right this minute, almost certainly, you know, maybe 20, 30% is coming from that firm and, and a little bit of wind power. But even solar panels and wind power are problematic for reasons I won't bore you with, other than they're not as clean or green as we might want them to be. So this poor picture has got all this stuff going on, that all these trees are non-native, you know, they've come in in an a, a, atypical kind of way. And I can even see like there's an avalanche shoot that maybe is new. All right, so nature has people in it. And this idea that nature is only one kind of animal and all the other kind of animals are bad or wrong is also something that I'd like to challenge. So this is a, a National Wildlife Federation graphic that shows a proposed bridge. Maybe you've heard about it. All the mountain lions in one part of Los Angeles are inbred and they need to get to these other mountains to be, you know, to have some population flow, some genetic flow. So there really needs to be a bridge over the freeway at a place called Liberty Canyon. It is coming, give it two or three or four years, it'll be there. It's, the money is there, the political will is there. Some of the locals are kind of moaning about it, but they'll, you know, they're being nimbies. We, we won't listen to them. But what was interesting to me is the way in which they want to market this to the public. They picked all these animals and some of these animals have nothing to do with the Liberty Crossing, you know, Southern alligator lizard, desert cottontail, they do occur in these hills, but they don't need this bridge to have good, healthy, robust genetics. They're doing fine. You know, golden eagles will not use that bridge because golden eagles fly. Uh, the toads are probably fine on either side. Really, only bobcats a little bit, and then mountain lions. The thrashers aren't going to use that bridge. Thrashers, you know, they're doing fine on both sides. They're not. They can actually fly with a freeway if they want anyway. So it's really a strange sense of who's in and who's out, like a who's who of animals they approve of, but other animals that are there as well, like, like the Virginia possum. And I put up the map here of the Bay Area, which shows, you know, th you know these are iNaturalist sightings. Obviously, possums are part of our daily life, but there ain't no possums on that map because somehow a non-native animal only counts for like half as many points as a native animal. But I don't know, I don't mind the non-native animals, eastern fox squirrels, uh, I think you're kind of snappy looking. They're mostly in Southern California. There are some in Golden Gate Park as well. There are some in Sacramento as well. I don't mind them. And I think that the hawks that eat them don't mind them either. Uh, purple vetch, you know, it's doing nitrogen fixing in the soil. It's pretty to look at. Uh, I don't, it coexists with native, uh, native species of wildflower. So yes, it is a European species. And yes, it came up with uh, Luther Burbank and so on. But really, I don't have such a problem with saying, that is an evil plant because it didn't grow here for the last 10,000 years. It's grown here for the last 300 years and it seems to be doing okay. Or I actually like the parrots of Los Angeles. You know, all those stories about there are populations of parrots in Los Angeles that may actually be numerically more 
robust than their native populations in the tropics because of the poaching and other habitat destruction and so on. Uh, not all the parrots in Los Angeles are, are more numerous here than there, but there certainly is a, a pretty robust population of red crowned parrots, for example, that's certainly in the aggregates of thousands and thousands and thousands of them, or starlings. And we can say starlings are ugly, I don't know, or starlings are bad or evil, or people talk about starlings the way President Trump talks about people of color, to be honest. But I don't mind the starlings, I don't mind the sparrows, and I don't see why we have to have such a dichotomy because Cooper's hawks love starlings and Cooper's hawks love house sparrows. They're probably eating way more of them than they are the native species. And so Cooper's hawks are in your side of the Bay Area, they're on the, on the east side, they're in North Bay, they're in Los Angeles. I've seen them in downtown Hollywood, downtown Los Angeles. They, are, they were riparian species along the gallery forest originally, but they have adapted to cities and they have adapted to cities partly because we have filled cities up with birds that they can just snack on. And those same birds like the house sparrow, they are dispersing seeds that are allowing plants to regenerate in vacant areas. So I'm not so much on the anti side of the non-native species. Nature has history. It is history. It is historic. So our vampire threat is kind of high right now. This is a trail uh, near, near the fire zones, really, Donner Summit, uh, uh, up near Truckee. And that's the trail. That's the trail this summer with my, with my wife and daughter on it. It was originally a Native American trade route. Then it was a wagon road. Then it was a toll road. Then it was a hiking trail that it actually had some deadfall and, and some rockfall that made it more narrow. But then they laid the fiber optic cables that came from San Francisco to Tahoe to Reno, and they had to widen it again. So this lovely, broad, easy to find trail, easy to bring your kids on, easy to put you know, in a stroller, you know, bring your toddler in a stroller, is because there's fiber optic cable under that dirt. And that dirt has space because it was a toll road and so on. This is something that we don't usually talk about. We say, oh, here's a hiking guide, just look at nature. That nature is historic. And that includes the fact that we have done a lot of resource extraction that allowed roads to come into areas, including Anza Brigo Park still has a, has a railroad line from a mine. And the fact that we have used labor in very exploitative ways behind Los Angeles is Highway 2 called Angeles Crest. It followed an old Native American path that followed a hunting path that, you know, that followed a mule train and pack, pack train and so on. But when it actually got paved in the, in the Great Depression to, to allow automobiles into the high forest, it was paved by convicts quite literally, they were told they had a chain gang up there. And no one ever thinks about that. But those men were probably socially disadvantaged people, probably people of color, they probably uh, uh, didn't necessarily have fair access to lawyers. And I just don't think there were a lot of wealthy white bankers on that chain gang, it was a certain social group. So if I go to Angeles Crest, I'm driving a road that was built with exploited or even enslaved labor, depending how radical you want to be about how you feel about justice. And by the way, it also kills a lot of animals. But there, ravens, this is I-5, that first rest area. So you know if you're going to come south on I-5, you've left the Bay Area, uh, you've left Hayward and so on. You've come out to I-5 by, by uh, you know, heading towards the, the Great Central Valley and the first rest area. These are you know, the native species. This is Northern Raven, but Mexican fan palm, so not native to California, planted all over, but not native. And they built a, Mama Ravens built a nest out of eucalyptus twigs and rope, rope from an old truck. And it's, they're probably going to eat garbage and roadkill. So these are native species that are surviving quite fine with, with this mix of native and non-native. Fires, I got nothing to say. We have to think, we're going to have to think about fire. It's going to, it's obviously it's here. Boy, we, fire is sure caught up with us the last three years, this year especially. This is a picture uh, from one of the fires in my area, Boda's pocket gophers coming out and clearing the debris out of the uh, tunnels. And they have stored food. They'll be okay for three months, four months, six months, but we don't even have a conversation. If we want the Boda's pocket gophers to survive and until the spring plants grow, if there's even any rain in winter, we, you know, one idea, let's just throw out bales of hay randomly across this landscape to feed the deer or to feed the gophers. It's not even something we've ever talked about or thought about. How do we sustain animals post fire we normally just say well they'll figure it out or, or they'll die or they won't die or whatever uh, how do, what does our management want to be post fire uh, nature's everywhere and i mean oh my goodness is it everywhere this is a lovely uh, coast live oak and it's between two freeways in los angeles it looks like it could be yosemite you know uh, i think i got it i think i cropped it there's a little bit of freeway right there there's another one left back there but we don't really think about pocket pieces of nature we know it's all got to be all of yosemite or all of the big reserve we may have to take little pieces of nature where we get them just as the world becomes increasingly fragmented. This is that same rest area. So you leave, you know, you leave the Bay Area, you're going to go south on I-5. There's one 
great place to pull over and finally use the restroom after being caught in traffic for the last two and a half hours in the Bay Area. And middle of summer, middle of the day, nice four foot gopher snake going down a boda's gopher hole. Nobody noticed. That was hilarious. You know, how many people were at the rest area on a, on a 10 a.m. On a, on a weekend, you know, morning, like 80 people were there and no one noticed the, the gopher snake. So nature survives in and around us and almost despite us. We can do things to help them. So we can put up a street child nest box that's in Sonoma at a winery, sure. But there's all these other little pieces of our, of our lives, of our habitat that we could try to do something with instead of just saying, oh, that's a storm drain, I'll forget about it. There are ways that we could plant wildflowers along here. There's ways we could put in a little, let's just lay some two by fours with a rope along this side and with the possums and the skunks have a egress back and forth above the water or put a little raised part of the channel so there's a little dry place for the coyotes to scamper about. We could utilize this space. We could think about this space differently if we just decided, wait a minute, I need all the nature I can get, even the forgotten nature, even the ugly nature. Little tiny things are nature too. And this is a lesson I've taught myself. I went out two weekends ago with intentionally trying to see how much of nature do I know nothing about. So green fruit beetle, also called fig beetle, is this is in Los Angeles. They're native to Arizona and New Mexico. They're spreading into California. <clears throat> they're great. They're about that big. They're bright green. I love them. And I have to say, like, I think I've seen them before, but I didn't even know what they were called. And then when I actually went out to look, so but my goal was to see small nature I never think about. So Mexican cactus fly and it it's pollinates things like a bee and it's got these great huge eyeballs and this shimmery iridescence, fabulous. I'm so glad to notice it. Uh, little tiny butterflies, I'm truly trying to train myself to see the small ones. It's like gray hair streak, just the size of a quarter, but it's, it's nature, why not? Uh, lichen, we're hopeless with lichen in California. Uh, England is a little bit better. You actually get a lichen field guide in England, but we just, Forget it. We got nothing on lichen. We got no way of thinking about it, no way of recognizing it. We can't, we don't have a rare lichen hike, you know. Let's go out and see 20 kinds of lichen. We're hung up on the birds. Nature after dark. Oh my goodness, there's so much nature after dark. I love scorpions. It is absolutely true. They glow in the dark. And with a with a UV filter flashlight for 10 bucks from you know Amazon, you can go see them. Uh, this is this is a species that's a little bit bigger than usual, but uh, there are lots and lots of scorpions. It's almost uh, like a shock when you realize how many like five scorpions in five minutes when you actually start looking for them. Bears, of course, here at night, we may not see the bear, but we can always see their activities. So here it was eating a bird feeder. Or if you have, of course, you know, any kind of trail camera or ring camera, we can learn what animals are around at night. Nature's ugly. We're not supposed to say that. We're not supposed to think about it, but it is. And one of my colleagues, shame on them. That was their coffee pot in the break room. Uh, I, I can even say what department they're in and I won't. As an English department major, I'll be polite, but it's actually kind of beautiful in its own Jackson Pollock way, but uh, lots of nature is a little bit odd. Bats are actually kind of ugly when you get up close to them. A lot of people think they are. So Western Mastiff bat, uh, one of the bats in your neighborhood actually has got a, a two foot wingspan, the biggest bat in North America. And that is not some contorted position where I, you know, it's not being, it's being held by a, a, a trained bat rehab person, but it's not contorted. That's sort of how it's got these big ears. That's the ear, those are the nose, of course, the little mouth down here, got lots of little pointy sharp teeth, the eyes way back there, and the little hairs for, for catching moths, noticing the moths when it catches them. Western Mastiff bat, that is its normal kind of, hello, I'm a bat, I'm about to do my thing. And then I love pallid bats. They catch uh, insects on the ground, centipedes and scorpions. Uh, they, they are ground predators. So they are actually, they're listening with those huge great ears, but they're not echolocating all that much. They're actually watching and listening. And when they hear something rustling around, a little stink bug, a centipede, a scorpion, down they go. But it looks like a, a demented pug that, that I'm not a big pug fan. I hope I haven't offended too much of the audience, but pugs are not my thing. So it's got that pushed up little piggy nose and kind of a dopey face and that sort of dirty yellow fur, like it needs a bath and these really odd sized ears. So I don't know, bats, I love them, but they're hard to take. Uh, for some, if, when you see them, they're a little bit oh, odd. Um, cactus, of course, people think cactus are, some people think cactus are ugly. This is a, a, a legitimate, you know, permitted bird banding station being run by an ornithology professor and his students. And I said, oh, we, you know, can we put out like a little tweet or a little, you know, a little Instagram thing? Like, let's get people up to, you're catching all these great birds. And then, you know, you take the bird out of the mist net and you put the ring on the foot and then you let it go. And they're like, well, too many people get upset when they see the bird in the net. We can't publicize what we're doing here. And so you can call that ugly or call it beautiful. To my mind, it's just a fact of life. The bird is migrating. I got caught in a net for about five minutes and we got to do the data thing and release it relatively unharmed. 
coming down to the ending because I want to do the Q&A with you all. So ugly nature. This is my house again, not my actual house, but not far from where I live. I got to be honest. Uh, the Antelope Valley, people think that it's ugly out here. It's mocked. It's, it was in the uh, the right stuff by Tom Wolfe, you know, the novel about Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, it's It's got a misperception as all crystal meth labs and and uh, KKK, you know, flat earth society people and KKK people, which is wildly untrue, but it's, but, but it does have a few tumble down houses, but that particular house that I just shot, you know, here's the bird. There was a Western tanager in migration feeding in the, in the, in the little uh, tumbleweed in the rabbit bush right behind it. It didn't care that that was there. It cared the fact that that created a windbreak so it could hawk for insects in migration and then keep on doing its thing. So ugly nature is providing sustenance to regular nature we all like birds birds are nature but the weeds behind the ugly house and the bats and the little centipedes and the scorpions collectively that's part of all of the symphony of nature not just one pretty part not just the medley part not just the little well watered streamside part so that's my little signal to you guys that we're about to go to, to discussion and we can try to unpack this a little bit more my publisher wanted me to put in one final slide so i have a book coming out in a month ish and it's sort of on these topics it's actually not this lecture it's actually 14 standalone essays but it, it does have the sensibility and the opening essay is about me going for a walk in vacant lots around my house at the start of covid Lots with a lot of trash in them, to be honest, and some burn scars and some abandoned vehicles and sometimes some feral dogs even. So salad only the devil would eat. The joys of ugly nature, not available yet, but give me a month and a half and they're supposed to start hitting the bookstores. I am told, even I haven't seen it. Uh, it's still on a boat coming from China, I guess, is that. So what we're going to do is do a Q&A or do our discussion or tell me what you think or tell me what you, what's on your mind. Uh, yeah, let's, 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 let's talk, please. Well, thank you for a very enlightening presentation. <laughs> um, you can tell that you've, uh, you've thought a lot about this. And, you know, here in Woodside, the, the town has the Backyard Habitat Award, where um, it's not so much about uh, creating a, an environment that's um, you know, special and with lots of birdhouses and things like that. But it's a matter of trying to leave things and making it accessible uh, to wildlife. So the, the community here is um, responding. There are more than 50 um, places in town where the Backyard Habitat Award has been given. So within our community, um, people are are thinking about it, but I agree with you that that nature isn't always what you see in in the magazines or in books like yours. That um, nature can be sometimes I find more interesting in a places like where you found that western tanager. And I want to praise everyone who's doing the backyard work. And I just zero escaped my house. It was a little bit expensive, but I was got, literally in one day, we already had bees and butterflies coming in as soon as I put in native. I took out my, I had, my, when I bought my house, it had a lawn and a tree like any house would. And so when I finally got around to zero escaping, you know, the, the, the effect was instantaneous, how, how rapidly I've made a, made a difference and migrant birds too are stopping by. So of course, all of us as individuals can make small changes. And that includes even how we, talk about nature when we go on a regular nature walk in our regular nature preserve you know, even remembering to you know look at the small stuff or stop and notice the lichen that kind of thing there's a comment from elizabeth about the zebras or as they say in kenya zebras uh at san simon i adore them i think it's hilarious you know you can see them right from pc you know right from the pacific coast highway highway one i think it's just delicious that they're and when i was a kid of course they were still Giraffes, you know, the whole menagerie, you know, is, is diminished over time, uh, her, her uh, menagerie. But I love the fact that the zebras are there. You know, they're not hurting anybody. Let them go. You know, they can hop over the fence. They're not going to breed and, and harm anything. So I, I, I like the visual surprise of it. Why not? We're, why not have a pleasant day by seeing a zebra in San Simeon? And then, and then go and see the elephant seals. You know, they're just north of the, of the, of the turnoff there for the big house, for Xanadu. Uh, so we, we have a question regarding um, post fire. Um, people want to know what your opinion that we should do to help um, wildlife recover. I'm. I, I've talked to a lot of biologists about this, and I really think 
we're at the stage where intervention is utterly reasonable and utterly ethical. And so that would include putting out artificial watering troughs or literally bales of hay for, you know, random rodents or something like that, or, or calcium, you know, that comes out of bones. So if we have some dead cattle, just throw the dead cattle out there and let the calcium go to the, to the rodents. Those fires are so unnaturally large. And so, you know, the fire interval is so brief, you know, we don't have time to recover between fire, that fire adapted plants are really being unfairly stressed in the wildlife with them. So I'm all for, you know, aerial seeding. If we have all these, you know, when they're done fighting the fires with the tankers, put a bunch of seed in there and try to get the, get, get things jump started once again. Uh, that's my personal feeling. I don't have any land management, you know, credentials here. I, I don't have a PhD in land management. I just think we need to be really upfront about, wow, we have hammered the landscape by all this fire suppression. What can we do to fix it? So um, you mentioned the, the drought uh, at Point Reyes where the tule elk are. And I know in your book about California mammals, you have a great picture there of tule elk, but they had a line of people more than a mile long passing water from one to another to fill up this small area where the tule elk feed because there had been no water, no rain. As these were all these people trying to help uh, the tule elk survive by providing water for them. Yeah, that's a tough management issue. And I'm glad I don't, I'm not the superintendent of Reyes, Point Reyes National Seashore because they're trying to balance the ranch historical ranch interests, which were part of the, you know, the agreement was when we're going to make the park be so big, we're going to allow the ranching to stay. And that's, and that's what we have a lobby that has the ear of Congress at the same time. But from a management standpoint, it's utterly illogical where there are fences, where there's not like, like you know, the, the, the two tear down all the fences and let the tule elk go wherever. And the ranches should have to, to deal with it says me, I'm not pro ranch. I'm actually pro the tule elk. That said, there are probably more tule elk there than there were true historically. You know, there were lots and lots of tule elk in the Central Valley, you know, lots and lots and lots. There weren't that many actually along coastal Bay Area, San Francisco. So we also could consider how, how, how could we do this socially? I don't know. Culling? Do we have too many elk? Do we need to kind of sneak in there at night with our SWAT team guys and take out a few elk once in a while for the health of the herd? Uh, good luck trying to tell the public that, oh yeah, we're going to go in at night and shoot elk. Uh, but it's, it seems to me a, a very bad compromise how it's being managed right now. Um, but and then um, someone is uh, agreeing with you regarding the annoyance with people who get hung up on native versus non-native. Now, personally, I am not a big fan of starlings, but I understand what you're saying. But anyone who is not a fan of starling has not spent any time observing large groups of them because starlings, when they get together and the murmur that happens when they move in this incredible ballet um, is well worth having them in our in our home areas, that's for sure. Well, starlings compete with purple martins, for example, in downtown San, uh, downtown Sacramento, and certainly they compete with other cavity nesters, you know, western bluebirds, and uh, I've watched them happen. You know, they actually come in and they. So there are. First of all, we're not going to get rid of the starlings, so we may as well just stop hating on them. That's just a waste of you know bird watching negative energy kind of thing. And the funny thing about starlings is, of course, they are so pretty with a little spangly thing and the nice that if there was a vagrant starling on Atu Island in the Aleutians all the bird watchers would want to fly there and tick it off their American list just the fact that they're all over the place uh people get a little bit self-righteous but yes they, we can say they're competing for cavity nesters we could also say that we just don't have enough cavities so let's just start putting up artificial nest cavities or putting up more oak trees or you know there's there's ways around this uh problem to my mind or the competition there's ways to think about the competition besides just hating on the starlings well um Charles I want to thank you again for taking your time to present uh, your wonderful program uh, for us this evening. And I'm sure you've created a lot of interest um, in the subject and hopefully in your books, which personally I've always enjoyed as well as your poetry. And I want to remind people that October 1st is our next first Friday where we're going to have uh, Jim from Faoli giving us a tour of Flaoli's greenhouses and nursery complex. And Flaoli is, uh, I don't know if you've been there, it's uh, quite uh, 
close by and it's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, well maintained gardens, um, not uh, filled with uh, natives, but with a lot of non natives as well. So I hope everyone will uh, join us for our next First Friday event. Thank you again, Charles, for presenting your program for us. And thank you. And Good remember applause. that um, you don't need to be a doctor to immediately realize <laughs> how we feel better when we're outside. So um, take some time, get out. You don't need fancy binoculars, just walk around or Examine what's happening in your yard. There's all kinds of stuff, very small beneath your feet. It's well worth your attention. So thank you all again for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week. If you missed any part of this presentation, remember you can view it on our YouTube channel and you can check that link at our website. So take care, have a pleasant evening. Remember, wear your mask, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. Good night.